Today we will discuss the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. In the sixth chapter, the Ashtanga Yoga system is described in detail. In the previous chapter, Krishna had mentioned very briefly about this Ashtanga Yoga towards the end of that chapter. Krishna continues to elaborate on the Ashtanga Yoga system right from the beginning of this chapter. First of all, Krishna describes who is a true yogi. He says a true yogi is unattached to the results of his work and a true yogi performs his duties as he is obligated. Two things Krishna mentions. Further, he says, one has to give up the desire for sense enjoyment in order to become a yogi. In this chapter, it is particularly important to note that the mind is the central point of yoga practice. Srila Prabhupada explains, it's not just that the Ashtanga Yoga system requires uh, mind control. Any yoga system requires mind control. There is no possibility of practicing yoga without controlling the mind. It is particularly true uh, in this Ashtanga Yoga system that one has to control one's mind to practice this Ashtanga Yoga system. And it is the central point of this Ashtanga Yoga practice. To become a yogi, Krishna says, one should control the mind and train the mind to be not attracted by sense enjoyment. Our natural inclination is to be attracted for some sense enjoyment. That's the only way most people know how to get happiness, through the senses. But yoga practice means to deny enjoyment through the senses. Why? We will understand in a later point in this chapter that yoga practice, especially Ashtanga yoga practice, leads to samadhi. In samadhi, which is the perfection of Ashtanga yoga practice, there is spiritual happiness which is unlimited. which is uh, described as boundless transcendental joy. So this uh, sense pleasures are very meager, very, very little. So an intelligent person understands that uh, giving up this sense pleasures which are very meager uh, is definitely worthwhile if you want to taste unlimited spiritual happiness. So Krishna also explains those who are attracted by sense pleasures or sense enjoyment they become more and more entangled in this world and are unable to practice yoga. Next, Krishna describes the different stages of, of advancement in mind control. Uh, what is implicit in this explanation is 
it's not very easy to control the mind a common man ordinary people they are simply driven by their mind they just work according to the dictations of their mind but yoga practice means we should not simply follow the dictation of the mind no so the most preliminary uh, step in mind control is when the mind is not agitated by attractions of sense enjoyment that's the beginning of mind control in this ashtanga yoga practice then what happens the mind becomes very calm in a calm state of mind when one is undisturbed by sense enjoyment such a person is not affected by any dualities like happiness and distress heat and cold honor and dishonor you can easily understand that when let us say it is like now summer is just coming so we feel hot the mind will dictate now try to look for a cool place sit on the fan better still if there is an air conditioned room let's go and sit in the air conditioned room so the mind always dictates like that when it is very cold oh i want some warmth i want some heat or uh, when there is some honor oh very nice but if there is some dishonor oh i don't like it so these dualities are always there in this world and one whose mind is not controlled is often disturbed by these dualities so yoga practice means control the mind and bring it to a calm state where the yogi is no longer disturbed by dualities on making further advancement in mind control the yogi is fully satisfied by knowledge and realization once earlier i had explained knowledge is theoretical knowledge which is available in the scriptures or which one hears from a discourse but realization is to be able to apply that knowledge or act on the platform of that knowledge or understanding that is realization so yogi is considered further advanced if he is fully satisfied by the knowledge he has got and the realization he has attained such a person is self controlled and he sees pebbles stones and gold as the same he doesn't uh give much value to material things <clears throat> for a ordinary person gold is very valuable but for a yogi who desires to advance in spiritual life he doesn't attach value to such uh material things a yogi is considered still further advanced when he regards different kinds of people with an equal mind 
who are the different kinds of people that are mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita in this chapter, in this verse. Honest well-wishers, affectionate benefactors, neutral persons, mediators, envious people, relatives, friends, enemies, pious people, sinful people. All categories of people a yogi regards them with an equal mind. What does it mean? Naturally, we behave or deal with different categories of people differently. If somebody is a well-wisher, as opposed to somebody else who is an enemy or envious, you would not expect that I would deal with them the same way. Then how is it that the yogi deals with them this with an equal mind? The yogi is able to see that people are victims of circumstances. Some particular dealing with one person, that dealing results in I becoming upset with him. Somebody else dealing is very nice, oh he is a very nice person. Actually, the real person inside the body is the spirit soul, as we have understood from the second chapter. And the spirit soul is not actually really uh, actually involved in all these type of interactions with people at the level of the body and mind. Since a yogi is trying to uh, advance spiritually, so he should be unaffected either by material possessions or by material relationships. Both of them he is not interested. Hmm? Then it's Krishna says, a yogi should try to concentrate his mind on Paramatma. Paramatma is the Supreme Lord Krishna who is seated in everyone's heart. Hmm? He should live alone in a secluded place. Why secluded place? Because he is not interested in these material dealings. He doesn't want to be disturbed by uh, people's ordinary activities. He should always be free from desires for material things. He should be free from uh, possessiveness. Hmm? Next Krishna describes the actual method of practicing this Ashtanga Yoga. So far some general characteristics of Ashtanga Yoga. Mainly involving mind control. Now the actual practice. What does it involve? Krishna says to practice yoga one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusha grass on the ground and then cover it with a deer skin and a soft cloth. A proper seat has to be prepared. Because the yogi has to sit on that seat. In Sanskrit it's called asana. You would have heard this term for those who learn this uh, yoga asana. Different bodily exercises. Uh, that yogasana also, the bodily exercises, are meant for making the body sufficiently uh, well suited for sitting properly in a proper posture to do meditation. That is the real purpose of practicing those bodily exercises. Here Krishna is not describing those details. He is talking of how to prepare a proper seat for sitting and doing meditation. Meditation is actually in the Ashtanga Yoga system 
it's a, a seventh step ashtanga means eight steps so meditation is actually the seventh step here krishna is not going into details though i said krishna describes in detail compared to the very very brief description in the fifth chapter here little more details are given the actual details are given in what is called as patanjali yoga sutra hmm? patanjali is the rishi the sage who has uh, described in detail in uh, a treatise called yoga sutra to practice this ashtanga yoga there the lot of details are given but here just briefly krishna mentions here the the process the practice one should go to a secluded place should lay kusha grass on the ground and then cover it with a deer skin and soft cloth the seat should be neither too high nor should be too low it should be situated in a sacred place so shrila prabhupad explains that if somebody wants to practice ashtanga yoga they cannot do it living in a city or a, or any place where ordinary people are busy with day to day material activities such a place is not suitable for a ashtanga yogi Hmm? the yogi should then sit on it very firmly and practice yoga by controlling his mind and senses purifying the heart and fixing the mind on one point mind control is not very easy in the ashtanga yoga system there is a specific method of bringing the mind under control hmm? krishna describes that how one should sit one should hold one's body neck and head erect in a straight line for practicing ashtanga yoga the head the neck and this back the spine should be erect in a straight line they should be erect and one should stare steadily at the tip of the nose staring at the tip of the nose all this is to actually bring the mind under uh, control hmm? thus with an unagitated i described this earlier mind should not be agitated by sense attractions unagitated subdued mind completely the mind has been made very calm hmm? devoid of fear just like one is in a secluded place formerly they used to go to forest but now it's not very practical to go to the forest to find a forest itself is very difficult hmm? even if there is a forest uh, we are not practiced to live in a forest uh, city dwellers even those who live in villages or small towns they are not practiced to living in the forest hmm. so uh, one should be free uh, from all kinds of fear then only the mind can be properly fixed up in meditation unless one is fearless one cannot fix the mind in meditation one should be completely free from sex life it's called brahmachari vrata brahmachari vrata means complete celibacy no sex life absolutely no sex life in this state of um mind one should meditate upon krishna within the heart krishna within the heart is seated as paramatma and make him the ultimate goal of life 
Paramatma becomes the ultimate goal of life. So, really speaking, this yoga practice is not meant for uh, reducing some weight, <laughs> improving the breathing. It is not meant for all that. The real goal is to have darshan of Krishna within the heart who is present as Paramatma. <clears throat> the goal of life, Prabhupada explains this, the goal of life is to know Krishna who is situated within the heart of everyone as Paramatma. This is the goal. Huh? Thus practicing con constant control of the body, mind and activities. The yogi, his mind regulated, ends his material existence. So what happens after one is able to actually see Krishna within the heart as Paramatma? The yogi is able to finish off this material existence and he attains the kingdom of God. He transfers himself to the kingdom of God. Then Krishna gives some general instructions. There is no possibility of anyone becoming a yogi if he eats too much or eats too little sleeps too much or does not sleep enough. Two particular activities Krishna mentions, eating and sleeping. These are uh, very, very uh, important to be regulated. Hmm? He who is regulated in the habits of eating, sleeping, that's already mentioned, but he Further mentions here uh, regulation in four things, not just two things. Regulation in the habit of eating, sleeping, recreation and work. Such a person can become free from all material pains by practicing the yoga system. The yogi if has to sit and properly do meditation, he should not be disturbed by any bodily problems. Do not complain, my back is paining. I am having some stomach upset. I am having headache. I am feeling too cold. No. All these disturbances will not allow the yogi to do meditation. So therefore, um, if he is able to regulate four things, automatically he is able to become free from all these material uh, pains. It's a complete science actually, the Ashtanga Yoga system. It's a perfect science. Of course, we will see how Arjuna will tell that this is very, very impractical. Nonetheless, Krishna describes this. When the yogi disciplines his mental activities and his mind becomes situated in Paramatma, meditation on Paramatma, devoid of all material desires, he is well established in yoga. So mind control is not the end of yoga. No. Mind control is for the concentration to be fixed on Paramatma in the heart. And when the concentration has become well established and the yogi doesn't have any material desires, then he is well established in yoga. Further, Krishna describes uh, how does a yogi be steady in meditation on Paramatma? As a lamp in a windless place does not waver. Hmm? 
Uh, when there is a, a lamp which is lit up, uh, a wick fed by oil, oil lamp, then if there is wind, then that uh, flame will be flickering or if it is too much of wind then the flame can be extinguished. But if there is no wind at all, then the lamp will be steady. So giving this example, Krishna explains, just as a lamp in a windless place is not wavering, similarly, the yogi whose mind is controlled remains always steady in his meditation on Paramatma. His mind will not wander. We have experience when we try to concentrate our mind on some particular activity, our mind will not very easily remain fixed for some length of time. Mind usually wanders. Hmm? A yogi has to stop this wandering mind and fix it completely on Paramatma, meditation on Paramatma. Then, Krishna describes the perfection of such meditation. In the stage of perfection called Samadhi, is a technical term, this is the last step, the final step of Ashtanga Yuga practice, the goal in fact, the goal, Samadhi. In the stage of perfection called Samadhi, Krishna describes very nicely, one's mind is completely restrained from material mental activities. This perfection is characterized by one's ability to see the self by the pure mind and to relish and rejoice in the self. Self means the soul. Normally we are so much concerned with the body, the mind and the intelligence. Whereas a yogi who has completely controlled his mind and fixed his mind in meditation on Paramatma, when he reaches perfection, he is able to see that soul inside, see himself inside by the pure mind. Hmm? And he relishes and rejoices in the self. That means he is no longer disturbed by either the body or the mind or the intelligence. In that joyous state, see he is able to rejoice in the self, so it is a joyous state. What kind of joy is it? He says, Krishna says, one is situated in boundless transcendental happiness. Boundless means unlimited. And it is a different kind of happiness than what we ordinarily know. Uh, it is spiritual happiness. Such spiritual happiness, unlimited spiritual happiness is realized through transcendental senses, spiritual senses. Inside these senses, these eyes, this nose, ears, hands, inside all this we have our spiritual senses. When I am seeing, I am not seeing actually because, just because of these eyes. These eyes are like instruments for seeing. But actually, I am seeing because of my spiritual eyes. Similarly, my hand, when I am holding this book, I am holding through this hand, but actually I am using I am getting the grip through my spiritual hand. So inside this body, there is this spiritual self, I, with spiritual senses. So those spiritual senses are awakened by yoga practice, even bhakti yoga, any yoga practice. The aim is to awaken our spiritual senses. Through spiritual senses you can 
experience spiritual happiness. It's a totally different type of happiness. It cannot be compared with any material happiness. And Krishna describes established in this state of unlimited spiritual happiness. One never departs from the truth. The truth is I am spirit, soul. I am not the body. I am not the mind. And nothing to do with this material uh, objects. Uh, so one never departs from the truth that I am spirit soul connected with Krishna. And that connection is established in Ashtanga Yoga through meditation on Paramatma. And upon gaining this the yogi thinks there is no greater gain. It is the highest achievement. There is nothing better, nothing higher. Being situated in this position, one is never disturbed even in the midst of greatest difficulty. Some natural calamity comes. Whatever happens outside, the yogi is undisturbed. It's a wonderful state of existence. This indeed is actual freedom from all miseries arising from material contact. In the fifth chapter, it was mentioned that all miseries are due to contact of the senses and the sense objects. But that sense contact resulting in misery is completely uh, gone when we actually become situated in Samadhi. Then Krishna further uh, describes some more uh, uh, points about this Ashtanga Yoga. One should engage oneself in the practice of yoga with determination and faith. Don't think that it will be very easy and quick to attain this perfection of Samadhi. It takes a long time. So therefore, there is a need for determination, there is a need for faith and one should never be deviated from the path. Hmm? One should abandon without exception all material desires born of mental speculation. All kinds of desires what we generally uh, think we have, material desires, are due to our material mind concocting in so many ways I can enjoy like this, I can enjoy like that, I can enjoy some other way. Hmm? So a yogi he stops this business of concocting all types of different enjoyment knowing very well no type of material enjoyment is worthwhile. It's all useless. Hmm? That way the yogi completely controls all the senses on all sides by the mind. Instead of engaging the mind for concocting different types of uh, desires for enjoyment, one should use the mind to control the senses and in this way engage in this uh, practice of Ashtanga Yoga with determination, with faith, uh, never deviating from the path of practice. Gradually, step by step, one should become situated in Samadhi by means of intelligence sustained with full conviction. See, the mind has got a role, intelligence has got a role, the senses have to be subdued, made very calm. All this is required. There should be full conviction in the intelligence that I am going to succeed gradually by making advancement on this path. I am going to reach the perfection of Samadhi. Thus the mind should be fixed on the Paramatma alone and should think of nothing else. Actually Samadhi is the state of total absorption in meditation on Paramatma. That is Samadhi. Complete absorption. Huh? 
from wherever the mind wanders due to its flickering and unsteady nature one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the paramatma so the mind's nature is to wander but krishna says you should not allow the mind to wander hmm. then arjuna he says the system of yoga which you have described appears impractical and unendurable to me because the mind is very very unsteady arjuna says four things about the mind the mind is restless turbulent obstinate and very strong mind control is not a easy thing to subdue the mind is more difficult than controlling the wind you can imagine if the wind is blowing like a cyclone or tornado who can control nobody can control if controlling the wind itself is difficult then how can one control the mind which is described by arjuna as more difficult than controlling the wind in short arjuna is telling it's just not possible to control the mind now what does krishna say to this objection raised by arjuna krishna says it is undoubtedly very difficult to control the mind krishna says yes it is very difficult undoubtedly but it is possible by suitable practice and detachment so the ashtanga yoga system gives many different um tips for those who are serious about controlling the mind on the whole this system of ashtanga yoga is not suitable for our yuga our age called kali yuga in the scriptures it is explained this was suited for one yuga called satya yuga in kali yuga it is recommended that one practice the bhakti yoga system it is more practical and it is easier and it is uh, um, also uh, very much possible for majority of the people to practice this bhakti yoga <clears throat> then krishna uh, concludes this uh, chapter by telling two things one is that a yogi is greater than a tapasvi greater than a gyani and greater than a karmi therefore in all circumstances he tells arjuna be a yogi and here the word yogi is uh, used in the sense of one who is able to uh, link up himself with the supreme lord krishna yoga means to link up hmm? so uh, krishna says finally about yoga of all types of yogis the one with great faith who always thinks of krishna within himself and renders transcendental loving service to krishna is most intimately united with krishna in yoga such a yogi krishna says is the highest of all because there are different types of yogis based on how they practice yoga karma yogis they practice yoga through performing pious activities gyana yogis practice yoga by cultivation of spiritual knowledge by gyana ashtanga yogis practice yoga by performing meditation and bhakti yogis practice yoga by doing devotional service by practicing bhakti so among all the types of yogis 
Krishna says the Bhakti Yogi is the topmost Yogi. So therefore the next chapter onwards Krishna goes on to describe Bhakti Yoga and he describes Bhakti Yoga in very very great detail. Uh, so we will see that in the next chapter. I will stop here. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Shala Prabhupada ki jai.